they bullied, they tricked, they lost. And now we know they were evil. So, and maybe in the next chapter, we need to heal them. So that seems very transparent when you look at it this way. Hmm. I think there's a missing element there. You know, and there's a clue in how you summed it up with they want to take over our bodies. Because to me, that conjures up the, the idea of someone or something that doesn't have a body. And I think that so far as trying to make this coherent, what's, what's happening and what's been happening for thousands of years, which I would say goes back to the Garden of Eden, and you know, that was the beginning, and that was the blueprint, that's how far back it goes. And that the, the indication there is also that we're talking about a metaphysical force, which is, we could say, a deep, deep psychological, and deep psychological is, is, is metaphysical. Uh, it includes the physical, but it's beyond just the physical. And the, in that story, too, there was an element that entered into the physical paradise and tried to undermine it and subvert it and hijack it to its own ends. And although I haven't really thought about it before, it seems as though that element, that anti-life deceptive element of the serpent, was also trying to gain access to, to Eve's body, to the body. Maybe because it didn't have a body, I don't know. But anyway, that's where I was going. That whatever it is that uh, is driving this massive, I would say beyond global, I think it's cosmic, I think it's, I think it probably even extends beyond this planet, but who knows, it certainly is trying to get, you know, get beyond this planet, um, that there's an element in, in it that's non-physical, and, um, I mean, you mentioned the ancestors, and I think there's a dark side, you're saying what the ancestors want, and I would agree that there's a massive ancestral guidance, impetus to get back to nature, to get back to the body, to get back to the ways of being and the ways of existing that have always worked for human beings. Well, kind of contradicting myself, in a certain sense they've never quite worked because they, they got sabotaged at the very beginning, but we were a lot closer, you know, way back when, even though that was the, the seed of rot was sowed at the very beginning. It took a long time to fully manifest as it has today and become fully vis visible. Um, and so, so yeah, the ancestors, there is, there's a portion or an aspect of the ancestors that is, I would say, is, is impelling me and guiding me and assisting me to get back to nature and back to the body. And it's very grueling. You have to be willing to suffer. You have to be willing to to face reality on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, I call it, uh, obeying the law of matter. It's just relentlessly uh, infuriating and frustrating and uh, oppressive, and, but, but a willingness to be there is the opposite of the transhumanist agenda, which is to try and escape the body. A willingness to be in the body and for the body to be in nature, that's the positive ancestral thrust, I would say, the human the divine human imperative. But I think there's a negative ancestral thing, which is this generational trauma that has a, there's a psychological fragmentation, which <clears throat> um, my sense is it's created generations of hungry ghosts, of fragmented psyches that were never able to embody, and so they were never able to die right, they were never able to, <clears throat> whatever it is that's supposed to happen when, when we die didn't happen. And so they're still around in some way. And, and that, that they want our bodies, and that behind that is something much, much vaster and more mysterious, which um, is this anti-life agenda, which is non-human. I think there's a non-human anti-life agenda here and the transhumanism, like we're seeing it being revealed. And the, maybe the last thing I want to say, uh, because I've been listening on for an hour and a half, and really enjoying and getting a lot, but it's also been bringing up a lot. And one of the first things that came up for me was Tessa when you said that 
about this experiment that we need to see the machine in order to uh, have a visceral sense of what, what's going on, what's hidden from us, with the nature of reality, the dark side of reality. Um, and I would agree, but I would say that we've all seen the machine, but that we were children when we saw the machine. And when we saw the dark side of reality as children, it was so traumatic, uh, it impacted us so viscerally, and we didn't have anyone to talk to because we were surrounded by people who, who had learned not to see it. You know? And so we learned to do the same. We learned to shut it out and to forget that we'd seen, that we'd, we were born into, into a kind of hell, a very real hell generated over generations. And um, so that, I think we have that memory in our bodies of what reality is. And I've been thinking about this recently because a very close associate ally, uh, I found out had taken the mRNA vaccine and then I found out the backstory, which is just what you'd expect. That he just believed the hype and, and dismissed the critical research as you know, conspiracy theory or... or disinformation and it was very it was very disturbing and very upsetting to me and so it's because I because we're allied in many ways but clearly not per mentally perceptually like his view of the world is completely different from my view of the world so I've been asking myself a question I've asked myself maybe my whole life you know why am I one of the only people who can see how bad things are uh, and how why have I always been able to see it and I think it's because partly it was too main reasons to come to mind. One was I was born into an elite family who were social engineering and although I didn't know it at the time uh, and, and it involved kind, kinds of child abuse that I don't remember but I'm pretty sure we're going on um, somehow I had a very early training like I was supposed to be one of the social engineers so some part of me has always known that, that there's, there's um, there's cabals that are manipulating reality but the other, the other thing is existentially I had a sense of unreality from a very young age and it tormented me and I could never get over it and never really got over it I just learned to, to push it out of awareness so even in my teen years I had a sense of being in hell and then in my early 20s I started doing the research and the kind of things that we've been talking about today although this was 30 years ago so it was nowhere near so advanced I, it was just ticking all the boxes and the last big box was, was ritual child abuse that really brought it all together that the children are being systematically traumatised, abused, tortured uh, sat satanically or in, occult, in an occult context that somehow made the whole picture coherent which we've, we've all been engineered at a deep soul psychological level and engendered with a false identity that will not see the reality that we're in because we're supposed to be batteries and if you say if we start to see it we're going to say no no matter how nicely it's sold to us viscerally we just you know, our, our, our cognitive faculties are sufficiently in tune with our felt sense of reality that we can a little bit perceive that we're in hell and so we just say no um, but yeah most people don't most people have just spent their lives pushing down that felt sense and there's layers and layers and layers and layers and there's so much investment in the system that the, we they have become one with the system and then um, so you can't tell, you know, where you end and the system begins and you feel you can't, I can't possibly get rid of everything. I mean, that's the spiritual quest. But at a more mundane level, most people are not willing to give up everything and just return to nature. And I said, I was going to, it was going to be the last thing about the children, but maybe this will be the last thing that in the last few months and even the last couple of days when I've been working on the land, physically very grueling I've been having that experience of going back to nature in a very visceral sense and it, it's constant suffering and it's constant rage and that part of me that wants to control is constantly pushing up against what cannot be controlled really nature although I'm, I am dominating it and, and fulfilling the, 
you know, the biblical injunction to have dominion over the earth, and it's it's so ironic because this is a pos- this is this is our, our life purpose part of it. But I think part of the reason is is that well, one nature does want our our sh- to be shaped by us, the symbiotic relationship with nature, and two is the false identity of a satanic implant cannot bear to be constantly confronted with na- with nature and the law of matter because it's so it's so galling and it's so humiliating and it's so grounding and it just reduces that identity to, to powerlessness. Um, anyway, but I was just to say that there in nature is the solution. I mean, while I'm wrestling and fighting with nature and cursing and swearing and cuts and bruises and wounds everywhere and I am getting something done, I mean, extending the garden and killing loads of brown balls and making space and freeing trees. But while it's being on, there's this little bird, that's like a thrush with a red breast, it's not a robin, but... And this bird, we've come to know each other because it, it, it come when I was having lunch and I would feed it, but, but now it's coming when I'm working because I'm clearing the land and so it's able to feed from... You know, find seeds and things that I'm uncovering, but um, we're very aware of each other. Like we have a relationship, and uh, it's not bothered or threatened by my presence. And uh, so, there in that environment and that context, with all of this going on globally, there's no threat. Like the more closely I'm relating to nature through my body and through my senses. The, the closer I am to reality, the easier it is to, to encompass what's going on globally and sociopolitically. And I have to say, I have no hope. I have no hope at all, soci- politically, socially, societally. As a species, I don't think there's even any hope for us. And yet, and yet I, somehow a human being can be in nature and be in love with nature and it, it's reciprocal and so I have that hope like our, our spiritual meaning uh, can be uncovered uh, through this through this and and to me they're complementary like the more I look at the nature of hell the more clearly I can see what I want and what is not hell I can recognize oh look it, it, it does seem to be I mean I've been using tools not actually electrical tools really, just hand tools. So there's a bit of technology, but it's pretty primitive. It's pretty primitive. So it's not total extreme, but I think for most people, last point, it is simply too extreme. The transition, to even think about it, might make the transition from what you're talking about, Tessa, with the conveniences and the complacency of society and all the, the pros that it's provided uh, at these hidden costs to, to, to move to essentially being a naked human being in the wilderness. That's essentially what it means. Uh, it's, it's too much. And so then to think about the reality, the social reality, because that's what it would mean. Like the more we see about the nature of society, the more clear it becomes to me that the only solution is nature. And, and so the the less willing people are to divorce from society and go back to nature, the less able or willing they are to see the nature of society, and vice versa. Right? The less able they are to see the nature of society, the less they're going to be guided or impelled, compelled back to nature. So I think there's, it's, um, it's a sort of critical mass thing. Right? I think there's fewer and fewer individuals who are willing to wake up, but those few are becoming more and more committed but I think it's the less of us are waking up, the more committed we're becoming. Right? I don't see it as a growing awakening. I see it as a shrinking awakening because the commitment is, is more and more. Right? Reality is... The best thing you say about it is it's reality. <laughs> right? but, but to the mind... I mean, I told the story about the little bird because... Well, I say there is something beautiful in here, the most lovely thing, but but God, I mean, 
that that's like a tiny ray of light in a vast seething black labyrinth of uh, human and non-human generated hell over thousands of years that it's not like I can just go and hang out with the bird. I mean, I know I'm going, that bird, as I say, that's just the, the light at the end of this massive species tunnel. I don't know how long it is and how dark it's going to get. And I don't honestly know if any, any of us will survive. It could just, you know, if I was the lucky one, it could just be me and the bird at the end of it. And I feel I have to be ready for that. And, and, and that, I mean, that is, is, is just a very, very hard road. Long and hard is the road out of hell, I think it's a saying. It's a very hard road. Off the water, we meet for fire. 